All right. So, my wife got me this little uh, this little toy here, and I'm I'm going to use this to keep my notes, keep myself in order. And I, I have a little PowerPoint as well. So at, on your sheet, you can see there's like slide numbers, so it can kind of keep you know where you're going. You know, down in the corner, there's going to be a little number on each um, each slide. So before I get started, I'm going to tell you a little story about my grandchildren. Um, some of you know my granddaughter, Allie, and um, Austin. Now, um, Allie's six, and Austin is, is 10. Well, actually, is he 10 yet? Did he just, he's going to turn 10 soon. So I bring them here on Wednesday nights, and if you guys know Allie, she's like um, very animated. And she's very, she has tons of energy, and she's just a rascal, really. Um, so last week, we were driving in, and um, we were driving into uh, to church and uh, going down 202. And I shared with, with them that Pop-Pop is going to be teaching next week. That, that's what they call me, Pop-Pop. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, Austin, you know, I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and Austin, he's over in the corner, he's playing with his phone, he's not really paying attention, and Allie is, she's listening, and uh, I said, you know, you know, Pop-Up's going to be a little teaching next week, and he's, he's a little nervous about this, and before I knew it, Allie was saying to me, Pop-Pop, why are you going to be nervous? And I was going to answer that question. And then before I could answer it, she stuck her finger out at me and she said, Pop, Pop, you need to be brave. <laughs> and stand up straight, too, she said. <laughs> I was like, OK, well, that's, that's pretty good advice from a six-year-old, I think. So throughout this night, if you start to see my posture become compromised, please say something to me, OK? So I can stand up straight. I don't want to make my granddaughter upset, OK? So, I'm going to try and work this thing. I was having issues earlier. Uh, let me see here. He said to turn it on on the side. Right, Andrew? Bear with me, guys. He's like, oh, it's easy. Here we go. I felt something. All right. So, here we go. We have a map of ancient Corinth, right? My wife was correcting me last night. She said, I'm saying it the wrong way. So, I'm going to use this little pointer thing. Just give us an idea of where we're at here. You got over here, Jerusalem, up here, Galatia, Greece, and down here. Oh, by the way, this is uh, Paul's second journey. I believe. Then you have Corinth, and then Athens. And there was a lot of activity here. I think some, some of the guys were talking about this isthmus here. And there was a, a lot of shipping activity in there. And so it just kind of gives you an idea what this ancient, what it looked like during the time when this letter was written. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to be moving around. Hopefully, that doesn't bother anybody when I'm, we're doing this. Um, so normally these questions would come in individually, but they're just, they're all there. So this, we got what we got. It's all in one shot. So I'm going to read this. Before we get started, we'll go through some of these questions. So what is sexual immorality? These are things we need to talk about for a minute. Before the New Testament times, the Jewish community used the word to refer to any kind of extramarital sex outside of marriage. That sounds kind of redundant, doesn't it? Because <laughs> extramarital is outside of marriage, right? So anyway, um, we just want to make the point that anything outside of marriage, including homosexuality, OK? What kind of people were the Corinthians, Corinthians the non-Christian Corinthians? Well, they were sexually immoral people 
Corinth was a city notorious for sexual immorality, and the pagan religions did not value sexual purity at all. And finally, who is this letter speaking to? Well, it's speaking to the Corinthian Christians in the church, okay? So, next, I think it would be a good time, and here's another thing where I could have a technical difficulty here. Um, we're going to just listen to God's word, okay? Sometimes when I'm running out of time at home, I'll actually listen to my Bible on my phone. I don't know if you guys do that ever. I do it a lot because I'm always running out of time and, and uh, I, uh, I have problems where I'm, I'm not good with time. I'm not, time's not my friend. Remember I said that the other night, guys? Um, so who would like to hold it? Scott, you're a good guy. You'll help me out here. Hopefully this thing is on. Let's see. Oh, that's not good. Power on we want, right? Yeah. Power on. So hopefully we'll be able to hear this from here. So the one issue that I have is my wife doesn't like the Bible man in my phone. She says he sounds a little creepy sometimes. So hopefully I picked the right guy this time and, and he's not so creepy sounding. Hopefully um, he's the inspired Bible guy, okay. I hope. <laughs> that's what I hope he is. Let's see if this works. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your congregation the one who did this? Even though I am absent in the body, I am present in the spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, I am with you in spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus. Hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough? our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All right, very good. Very good. Thanks, Scott. I'll take that back. This also works in the shower. You, know, you stick it right to the wall. It's great. It works really good. All right. All right, so next, let's go to slide four. Um, it says here, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his wife's, or his father's wife. So let's go to the next slide. And like I said, normally they would have been coming in one by one, but it's all there. It's all, it's all the toothpaste is out of the, out of the bottle, as uh, Steve said the other day. <laughs> uh, first question: What are some of the things? Or actually, what are some of the things we can infer about this man and his stepmother from this this, this first verse? Because of this word has we can suspect that this is an ongoing sexual relationship, okay? Either as married or living together, whatever. The verb to have is a euphemism for the enduring sexual relationship, for an, an enduring sexual relationship, not just a passing fancy or one night stand type thing. Neither the man nor the woman were mentioned by name, but it's understood that the man is, is a Christian in this relationship. In some commentaries, it's thought that the woman involved may not be a Christian, for she isn't even addressed directly in the letter, really. 
his father's wife. Notice Paul didn't say his mother. He said his father's wife. This would imply that she is his stepmother, of course. The Bible clearly teaches that this is a sin. And you can see that in Leviticus 18, 8, and um, uh, Deuteronomy 22, 30, and 27, 20. Okay, so at this point, um, we're going to go back. So excuse me for going back to slide five, or four, rather. And it says there, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. Now, Paul understood that this kind of relationship, even in the Corinthian culture, would be considered taboo and unacceptable to the Corinthian Christians. They seem to be accepting of this behavior. And you see here it says it actually was reported. Next. This wasn't some kind of a private scandal or you know, a secret thing. It was a public thing. I mean, it was well known to the public. And then next, it, it talks about, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? This is the part where you guys can talk. Yeah. Yes? Yes, non-Jews or non-Christians, maybe, right? Um, so what, well, what kind of... What makes this bad is this type of behavior is not even tolerated among unbelievers. Yet the Corinthian Christians were allowing this. So let's move on. We have to go up to six. Here we are. We're in verse two. So usually when I'm at home fellowship, I'll do this thing where I'll let people read. Um, does anybody want to read the next? Would you like to read the next verse? Okay, speak up loud so everybody can hear you. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Yes, thank you. Um, why do you think Paul referred to the Corinthian Christians as puffed up? Yes, they yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Did you, did you have? Arrogance. Same thing, yeah. yeah. Okay. Dragon, maybe. Um, well, you know, the Corinthian Christians were probably allowing this in the name of tolerance, mm. you know. Um, they probably were saying to themselves, look how loving we are. <laughs> we are expecting accepting this brother just as he is. Look how open-minded we are. Does that sound like somebody? Like, like Americans, maybe? They were puffed up because they were proud of their acceptance of this man. They thought it was something good about them. But instead of glorifying what they were doing, they probably should have been grieving, I think. So... You know, I think I'm going a little bit fast. Those people over there, they're going to be mad at me if I finish too early, you know. So what time is it, 7.30? Okay, i got to slow down a little bit. Okay. Um. <laughs> All right, we're on slide seven. We're in verse three. For I indeed, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. So the question I have here is, have already judged. Is Paul disobeying what Jesus said in Matthew 7? Judge not that you not be judged? Okay, that was quick. Guys didn't even have to think about it. Hi, Peter. Um, yes, you're right. 
Um, no, Paul wasn't being disobedient in the slightest way. Jesus commanded in Matthew 7, forbids hypocritical judgment and judging others by standards that we ourselves do not want to be judged by. Paul is perfectly willing to apply the same standard to himself that he is applying to the Corinthian Christians. What's that, honey? Matthew 7? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what I did, isn't it? Um, yeah, why don't you read it to us, honey? You, you, you're, you got a good voice. I think you should do it. <laughs> Since you brought up Matthew 7. See what happens if you say something? Yes. So if they're using a non-biblical standard, mm -hmm. that same non-biblical standard will be applied to them. Yes. And that, I think, reflects something they may have been puffed up about. Look at how forgiving we are. Yes, we yes, forgiving. yes, definitely. Did you want to read that? No, I just wanted to read it. Carol, read it. Carol's right up here in the front. <laughs> she can read it. Very good. Thank you, Carol. All right. Yes, that's right. That's my wife, by the way, over there. Jean. <laughs> she doesn't want me to tell her, everybody that. Yes. I have a little bit of a question with this. Is this being accepted because Paul has been so far away from them they're ignorant about their, the expectations of God for their uh, character? Or are they just, again, ignorant in thinking that it's acceptable? Well, or? what I think, and, and if anybody else wants to, to, to chime in, feel free. Um, I think they're really influenced by their culture. And I think that... Um, they were in this, this pagan world that was so accepting of so many bad things. I mean, the other night we were studying in our home fellowship and we looked at an aerial view of, of old Corinthian, uh, the, the city. And it, it was like temple after temple after temple, all these pagan temples everywhere. And I think it was a byproduct of what they were living in and they were just kind of being sucked into. That's what I think. Does anybody else have anything else to offer? Yes. Well, the scripture says that you're puffed up and, and have not rather mourned. There was no mm. concern whatsoever for the soul of the brother that was doing it. Mm. Or the, where there was no, like, we need to approach him because maybe he doesn't realize what he's doing. Or sometimes, like you said Sunday, you have to get in people's grill. <laughs> even fewer if, there's some situations, sometimes even with family members, where you have to be kind of hard if you have that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm getting from it, that we're not judging it. Maybe it was a case of, oh, look how, aren't we wonderful? We're so forgiving. Mm -hmm. Or not my problem, not my concern. Then there's no concern for the, the brother and the, the sister that's yes. involved. Because when he says that even the Gentiles don't, it's like pagans ain't even doing this. What's going on here? Yes, you yes. Know? But they had, they had no... Um, Sorry. That's, that's okay. I can't hear, so I never know if somebody else is speaking. Um, they had no knowledge of the Old Testament. 
Mm-hmm. They had no knowledge of the law. Mm-hmm. Why should they? They weren't uh, a Hebrew culture. Mm. That's true. Very and, true. And ties back to what you said about their pagan base of operation, which is decades and decades mm-hmm. and centuries okay. old. And even their gods, they made their gods like them. They were immoral, questionable beings. Yes, yes. Very good. Good point. Didn't you call them Corinthian Christians then? Yes. Yeah, they were adopted in. They weren't born that way. Yeah. Because Paul came through and he, and he established the church there. <laughs> are they true believers or was he a believer or was he just that he had left paganism uh, you were speaking about the man yeah. yeah you know I'm not really sure I, 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 I think that he was a Christian but he wasn't a hardcore Christian certainly not so it's questionable as to whether yes that's right Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they say, judge not, lest. Okay, we're done. <laughs> I think there was a premise that within the church, you can judge your brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. You can't judge outside the church. No. Mm. That's exactly right, and we'll get into that. Because this is who we're dealing with, is the Christians inside the church. Right. We're not talking about the people outside. So that's a good point, Warren. Thank you. All right. So let's go on. Is everybody okay with this, this kind of format, talking? and Okay, good. You know, John used to do this years ago. I don't know if you guys remember any of you. He used to sit up here and people would raise their hands. And it was, you remember, right, Barbara? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it got too big. He couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> so what was Paul talking about when he said, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh? Was he talking about the destruction of the physical body? Yes, if necessary. Yeah, as if necessary. Um, do you think maybe he was talking about the spiritual power of sinful flesh? Um, for me, what came to mind was um, Romans 6.6. 6. And I'll read it to you. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, the body of sin might not be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Um, The next question says, what is the goal of the church discipline for the unrepentant Christian here? (coughs) Or maybe like restoration, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And it, and, and if we go over to 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, does anybody have that? Yes, Allie, thank you. Okay. 3, yes, to 15. Okay. Take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. Stay away from them so they will, will be ashamed. And 3, yes, please. That's good. Good. Thank you. Um, So I got a question for you. In today's church, does putting anyone outside the congregation, is that, or excommunication or disfellowship, does that bring repentance in today's, in this culture? Mm. Because the other will, will watch you, and you could lead somebody down the wrong road. So if they're not here, that should be they should be missing that. Mm. And then just like if mom says that's it, we're done. You're gonna act this way. My house, my rules, get out. Well, that's what my wife out. said, actually. There are too many churches for them to go to. There aren't too many families for them to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, about what you just said. <laughs> yes. I actually just had that happen in the last church that I went to. Really? And it was a, a scenario of having a relationship extramaritally, and they did put him out of the church, mm -hmm. and it didn't bring him to repentance, and he went to a more tolerant church. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, that was his, then that's his choice. Which yes. Yes. Well, you know what? Um, Jeff Jackson actually spoke about this on Sunday. Do you guys remember? Were, were you guys here on Sunday? Um, I wrote down rarely because it's so easy just to go to another church, just like some of us already said. Um, and uh, here comes the old man glasses here. Hold on a second. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. I love that name. That's a good name. Um, so, you know, on, on Sunday, Jeff spoke about the, the American individualistic culture versus the collectivistic culture. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. um, found in other parts of the world, that collectivistic culture. Um, with collectivistic group, your identity is through the group, mm -hmm. right? Um, with the individualistic or the American style, uh, everyone has their own individual identity. Church discipline or excommunication, whatever you want to call it, is more impactful with the collectivistic group, of course, um, because they are no longer part of the group and their identity is lost. So they don't, it's more impactful in other parts of the world. You know, here it's just like, yeah, you, you're not doing what I want. I'm just going to go across the street over there and, and, and I'll. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. That's right. Um, yes, Peter. If I could just, I just wanted to interject. I, I've personally seen this situation two different times, mm -hmm. two different outcomes. And a lot of it was driven by the congregation. One guy, the congregation went after this guy with venom. Mm -hmm. and he just left and went so far away that nobody could ever. There was no him. love. No love. The next one was a worse infraction, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. But this guy was loved through it. His marriage was restored. Mm -hmm. He was restored to fellowship. And now he's got a ministry helping other people that have been through affairs and he and his wife run it. Wow. And it's, a lot of it is driven by the love of the congregation that is disciplined. Mm. Can you guys hear what Peter's saying over here? That's awesome. You know, it's awesome when we surrender ourselves to the Lord, how he can use us in a powerful way. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yes. Maybe I could interject something else that we have to consider today. Mm -hmm. Today, somebody might just as likely go out and get a gun and come in and shoot you. That's true. That's true. And that's why we have such a great security team here. Yeah. But that's seriously, mm -hmm. that, that is a problem. That is true. That is true. The world is desperately why? wicked. Yes. Put a person out. Mm -hmm. the, the leadership yes. of that church mm -hmm. notified every other Bible believing church in the area that said, We have put this person out mm -hmm. because of. And, and they got the word out there. Yeah. Accept them in full fellowship mm -hmm. because of non repentance. Yes. Yeah, that would be a good way to do it. But unfortunately, we're not totally connected with all the churches that people might go to. So I saw your hand up, yeah, sir. I was going to say, like, I think there's on some level that an excommunication is an excommunication from the spiritual church. So the covering of the church and the protection and the spirit, uh, that's what, that, like, on some level, like, that's what they were doing. They, mm. were, they weren't simply just kicking the person out of one particular church, but they're saying that your actions place you outside of the congregation mm -hmm. as a whole. Okay, good point, good point. Um, I saw some other... Yes, sir. <laughs> hey. Expecting the elders. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing of that church was already already acquainted with God and all the directive and there was 
plenty of Christians there. Mm -hmm. However, this person has violated that, you know, gross sin mm -hmm. because the, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And you are not to destroy it. There are ways to deal with them. First, you confront that brother one to one. Mm -hmm. Then the group of elders, usually. Yes. And if there's no repentance, then the church. And then you have no choice. If there's no repentance, you cannot tell me that because we live in the 21st century, all of a sudden we rewrite the word, mm -hmm. you put them out. Mm -hmm. Period. To make sure that, you know, one bad apple in the basket, what does that do? Right, it's the whole basket. souls that are not strong enough to have such a brother or for that matter a sister in the congregation. Sin is sin, period. Yes. There are no compromise with God's word. You either live by it or you fall by it. Yes. Good point. And just so everybody knows, we follow this model here at this church. And I've seen it already. Okay. What's over there? What? <laughs> Did you want to say something? Yeah. Yes, okay. I think it also matters whether they're in some position of leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, people can worship or come to a place where there is worship going on. Mm -hmm. Maybe it makes them feel good or something. But yes. They certainly cannot be in any position of leadership. Oh, certainly not. Certainly not. Yes. And as we, as born again, Mm -hmm. And some of us have come out of some nasty stuff. Um, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is, is there. So uh, if it's not happening because you've ignored him and it's not happening, were you really a believer to begin with? Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. All okay. right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of different theories about who this guy was. He could have been very wealthy, maybe. Maybe he gave money to the church. I don't know. Maybe if they, they put him out, they would have lost some of their income. I, there's a lot of different speculations. Um, but I think that they were um, definitely um, puffed up. Definitely puffed up. Okay, next, go to verse 6. And it says, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So I was going to like bring some bread in here, like an object lesson, you know, and have some non-leaven. My wife told me that would be too much. She said no. You know, I was going to have like a non-leaven bread in there. Yeah, and I was going to give you guys the bread because we don't eat bread at our house, I don't think, too much, really. It would just go moldy. Um, it says, your glorying is not good. Again, the Corinthian Christians were proud and pleased to be ignoring this man's sin. They thought it showed the whole world how loving they were. How loving. But you don't show love to a body by being kind to cancer. Mm -hmm. This man was like cancer, pretty much. All right. So the next verse that's coming up is verse 7, and it's talking about um, purging out the old leaven. And it made me think about my life a little bit um, and going back 32 years um, when, when I got saved or before I was saved actually. Um, life was about me pretty much. You know, how could I satisfy me? 
I was a very self-centered person before I became a Christian. And I can remember one night in particular, and this is my story. It might not be that way for everybody else, but this is, this is me. And I remember one night I came home, and shortly after I got saved. And by the way, if you want to hear my testimony, um, I'll be uh, giving it sometime in June. I forget what the date is, but the men's breakfast, you guys, you want to hear the rest of the story, you can come out. Um, but I can remember I had been drinking that day. And I, I came out, and I was getting ready for bed, and I decided I was going to kneel down and pray. And I remember feeling like there was a covering over me. Like I couldn't, my, my prayers were just going up to the ceiling and that was it. I kind of felt like God was saying, I, I don't want to hear you the way you are right now. And again, that, this is my story. This is how God was dealing with my life 32 years ago. And um, that feeling of, and I was a new Christian, you know, and that feeling of separation from God, I just decided right there that this was not for me. This alcohol in me, were, that, that wasn't going to work. And in a sense, that was God taking some of the old leaven out of my life, taking some of that, the old sins out of my life. Um, because I had a lot of people who had problems with alcohol in my family, and um, I just, I had to take it out. So, there's probably a lot of you who've probably been a, lo- a Christian for a long time. And, you know, God might be speaking to your heart too, saying, you need to get rid of some things in your life. I don't know. I don't know what that is. It might be something completely different. But if he is speaking to your heart and telling you to get rid of some things, listen to him. I mean, don't, don't ignore that, that small voice that's speaking to your, to your heart. Believe me, there's people that are watching you. They know you're a Christian. They're watching you. And you're speaking loudly about your walk, and, and, and you represent Christ. So think about that. That's between you and God. I'm not telling you what you need to do in your life. That's between you and God. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. How am I doing, honey? How's the time? Let me see. Eight o'clock. Okay. Very good. Verse 7, therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was crucified for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The leaven here mentioned isn't merely yeast but it's a pinch of dough left over from the previous batch of bread. This is how bread was commonly leavened in the ancient world. A little pinch of dough from the old lump would make the whole new lump. Dough rises and puffs up. So we know that leaven or yeast is a representation of sin. Yes, yes, easy. What is the old leaven that was, and I kind of talked about that earlier. What was the old leaven that this verse was speaking of? Yeah. But old leaven would kind of say maybe old sins maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Old bad habits. Old stinking thinking? Yeah. (laughs) Pride and arrogance? Yeah. Yeah. Sins of the past. So God wants us to purge out the, and get rid of those old sins. Okay? So Chris, he wasn't talking to the men. 
so much as to the Christians, the church. Yes. Saying, you're the guys that have the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he has a problem, but I'm talking to you. Yes, you're, the one you're 100% correct. Yes. It's easy to look at the other guy instead of ourselves. Mm -hmm. You're right, you're right. This was maybe 20% uh, to the man and 80% uh, to the Christian community. Um, so, why would we infer that the majority of the church leaves him because of this one guy who's been cut? Because of their reaction of how they dealt with his sin. They didn't deal with it the proper way. That's what I think. Sin of omission versus commission. Excuse me, Peter? Sin of omission by not... Yes, not yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right, so here we are at... I don't know, I... I Kind of wondering if I push the button. Did I advance to the next one? Did we? Okay. Should I be on 12? Is that what you say? Oh, okay. There we go. Yes. So the question is what was the reason for the unleavened bread in Exodus 12, 17 through 18? Who's going to read it? Oh, she's going to read it, Ruth? Okay. She's on top of it. Would you like to read that to us? Exodus twelve seventeen. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month you are to eat bread made without yeast, from the evening of the 14th day till the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses, and whoever eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he's an alien or native-born. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must not eat unleavened bread. Yeah, that's all right. That's good. So... Uh, so what was the, the reason for the, the unleavened bread? Does anybody, anything? Eating on the run, didn't have time to look There you go, Myron, yep, yep. And they were told to do that too, yep. right? right? And um, it was to be a sign of remembrance, right? Yeah. Um, that God delivered them out of... Yes, yes, he is. I've been reading a lot of the Old Testament, and it's very detail-oriented, very. We forget that. You're right. Uh, in verse 7, it says, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So how do we become a new lump of bread, so to speak? Well, we, we trust in Christ, who is our Passover lamb. He paid the price for the leaven or the sin to make us a new lump of bread or a new creation, right? Now, I'm assuming most of you people are all Christians here, but that might not be the case. You might just be visiting and be like, what is this guy talking about? You know, old leaven, new sin, old sin, Passover lamb, all this stuff. You know, this might be all foreign to you. If, you, if that's you, please come and talk to, to me or to come talk to Steve or, or one of the elders so we can tell you about this great Jesus that we're speaking of and the, the great salvation he offers. Just come and talk to us afterwards, please. I can't make that assumption that everybody here is a Christian. <clears throat> All right, here we go. 12. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual, sexually immoral people. So in verse 9, Paul talks about writing an earlier epistle to the Corinthian church. 
which is often called the, the lost letter. Most of you probably know that because it was not preserved by the Holy Spirit through the church. Um, it's also said in verse 9, not to keep company with. Paul's referring to the relationship that is close, but not a, just a social relationship, but a, a real close relationship. That's what he's talking about here. So I was supposed to bring this, this part in later, but it's all in one shot here. So forgive me for this. Things not working the way I wanted it to. So it says, we're on slide 13 and we're at uh, verse 10. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexual immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since then you would need to go out of this world. So verse 10, Paul clearly shows us that we are to separate ourselves from unbelievers, otherwise we would not carry out Christ's command, or not to separate ourselves from, sorry. Um, because we wouldn't be able to tell them about salvation in Jesus Christ if we did that. And that's when this thing is supposed to come in. Well, actually, I, I was going to say in Matthew 28, 18, it gives us the the go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. You know, we, we have that, and that, that would contradict that type of thinking. Now we have, is anybody familiar with this monastic movement? What do you know about the monastic movement? Monastics were those who were going to separate themselves from society so as mm -hmm. to not be tainted by the sinful attitudes. Mm -hmm. And they became more and more extreme um, they would build their residence up on a pole so they can't even talk to people. They just mm. bring up their food, bring up their water. And, but mm -hmm. um, to the point where they lost relevance to a lost world, they, they were just those crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> those crazy people. Mm -hmm. the, the faith. Some of them got very legalistic about it. Kind of like these people. Yes. So the theme of the monastic movement could be maybe thought of as like separation and seclusion. And that, that was probably the whole spirit behind it, really. Um, so... I mean, I can't read those little letters I put up there, but it talks about, I think this is uh, St. Uh, Benedict, is it, or something? Or, but uh, it's a 5th century picture. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's, I don't think that's what we need to be. But that's what I think he's talking about. In reality, that's why God wanted the Jewish people in the very beginning. They want to clear away from the pagans. Hmm. God wanted the Jews for himself, and he was for them. Not for the, not for the Gentiles and the pagans around them. Mm. It's true, but that's not now. Yes? Some of the things described here, and some of us that had the Lord has delivered us from, mm -hmm. then it's our responsibility, because we've been there, done that, and know the language, to go to others. Because I know for myself, my, what I believe. I'm not saying that if you've never drank or you never did drugs that you can't minister to a doper. But if you're going to hit the streets, you better have been that dirty or you're not going to know how to talk to them. Yes. Yes. The police will not bother you <laughs> if you've been there. So that, that we're better able to minister to them. Yeah. Because we know what the Lord has done for sure. us. Sure. And then they look at us like, oh, you don't know. And see, you didn't always look like this. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's, and that's our responsibility. And that's so great how God uses the things from our past, you know, things that we're embarrassed about almost. That's how it's been in my life. He uses it now and today. Right. 
things that I would never even tell anybody about. But he put me through those things. And Chris is dead, so you're talking about my mother. Yeah, and I'd like to think that, you know, I, I, my kids were growing up, I, I was kind of embarrassed to talk about how I was before. They didn't know me before then. So that's a time in the story for another time. Different pop pop, yeah. <laughs> That's where some of the old leaven of our lives can be used to connect with what was our old leaven, the current sins in that other person's life. Right. Mm. And it's like you said, it is shame, embarrassment, all of those things that Jesus took care of. Right? Mm. This is what I was. It's a great testimony. But then I met yeah. Christ. Yes. But I met Christ, yes, yes. And, and, and look what he did for me. Amen. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I didn't do everything right. You know, I, 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 I probably should have shared more. I've told Steve this before. You know, I probably should have shared more with my children as they grew up about how, how dad was, but I didn't always do that. I wanted to just know him, me as the Christian guy, you know, but... I went back as, as they were adults and I shared with them more things. So let's move on. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a rivaler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. So Paul's telling us here in verse 11, if a person claims to be a Christian, yet is indulging in these types of sins, not to even have lunch with them. Remember when Jeff was talking about that on Sunday? Um, you know, in that culture of the day, and in many cultures today, eating with someone is an expression of friendship and partnership. I have some Middle Eastern friends at work if I go out to lunch with them, that's a big deal. You know, if I take them out for lunch and I treat them to lunch, we're, we're sharing something there. It's, 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 it's different than it is here. In that culture, that, that was a big deal. So when he says not to even eat with them, that's, that's serious. Okay. No, no, it does not say that. Yes. Because putting them out was to put away the sin of the flesh mm -hmm. and restore them. Yes. That's why I said restoration is the goal. Restoration, and if not, God will take us away because of the testimony, yes. the, the contradiction. And there has to be love, just like Peter spoke about right. earlier. There was one gentleman exactly. that didn't come back, but there was another man that had a whole different journey. And he was loved. And that's we gotta remember that. Yes. I think I'm kind of reading in verses like he's telling us um, holding the brothers and sisters, the other Christians to a higher standard. Like not he's not saying don't keep company with any sex sexually or immor immoral or covetous or idolater, but a brother who is yes. falling under those headings. That's exactly right. Somebody in the church. Right. Not not, the not the people out there. Not the people out there. And the, here's the difficulty in this. Galatians 6, if any brother catches or overtakes a brother caught in a fault, trespass. Mm -hmm. Restore such an one looking to yourself, knowing that you too can be tempted. Mm -hmm. This is a style of life reverting back to something they may have come out of. Mm -hmm. This is yes. not the occasional uh, falling down back into what you did. This is staying there. Yes. This is the yes. refusal to get up and come and confess, receive the forgiveness of the body, and be restored. Yes. That is 100% correct. Thank you. And to your point, for what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are on the inside? 
Unfortunately, I think many Christians are busy judging those on the outside of the church, and they're neglecting the purity within the church. It's easy for us to point at the world and judge them, but shouldn't we expect them to act like sinners? You know? Shouldn't we? So, that's to your point. But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourself this evil person. So the Corinthian Christians were failing to judge where they should have judged. They turned away and ignored the sin of this man, and at the same time considered themselves loving for doing this. So as I wrap this up, I wanted you to consider a couple of things. For a person who claims to be a Christian and continues without remorse. This type of Christian is, is hurting, is not only hurting himself, but he's, he, he could ultimately be affecting his salvation talks about in verse 5. In addition, this type of Christian is affecting the, the unity and purity of the church, second point, and how we are viewed by the world. The church needs to confront and discipline, even though it's hard, and they need to do it in love. Yes. So... I think, um, I think we're, uh, we're getting to the place where we need to end. Okay? So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. I mean, I, that was a little different than we're used to, but um, I think uh, it was very thought-provoking, and, and um, I think uh, it was nice. You guys did a good job. Thank you. Can I just ask a question? Yes, Carol. Is this guy really a Christian? Is he really a Christian? And then you put him out, and before you know it, he comes back and shoots him. But, but he came to church every day. He looks like he was a Christian. Yeah, well. So would that be like the... It could be. It could be. I, I think... Um, it, I, I, don't, I don't know. Only God knows whether or not, you know, what's in a person's heart. And um, so to answer your question, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but... Uh, well, No, 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 that's a whole nother issue altogether. <laughs> yes. I believe for myself, I think, um, as we are all brothers and sisters, I don't know everybody in here. I look around trying to remember faces. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I knew that Ephraim was doing something, that would hurt my heart. Yes. And I'd say, Bill, you got to talk to him. You have to tell him. He, yeah. He, he don't know what he's doing. This is where I would think, not look at him. Yeah, right. Because it's you have love in your heart for your brother or your sister. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and if he doesn't want to listen, then you try it again. I mean, it's that you that should hurt your heart to see a brother or sister. Yes, definitely, and that's the whole the whole thing that we're talking about here. If you love me. Matthew 8. Matthew 18. Jesus deals with this thing. Jeff talked about it on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the second place Jesus mentions the church. The church. Mm -hmm. We also have been talking here about like this was the only sin in this big church. They had a lot of problems in that church. That's why Paul was so concerned with them. Sure. Sure. They, they really had enough to go around, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, why don't we close in prayer? Lord, thank you for uh, your word. This is your word, um, and we are your people. We thank you for uh, what you, uh, we talked about tonight. Thank you for all the great input, Lord, and how um, 
people um, interacted. And, and Lord, I just pray that some of these truths would resonate and speak to our hearts. Um, Lord, I just ask that you would um, go with us from here and keep us safe. Lord, I pray that um, if there's any old leaven that we have in our lives, that we would purge it out and get rid of it, Lord. You know once what's best for us. You, you love us and you care for us. Help us to love each other. And Lord, uh, I just want to lift up my brother, Mike Fischera, to you, Lord. I, I'm thinking about him, and uh, he's just been on my heart all day. And uh, Lord, I just, I just pray you'd be with him and his family, with Linda and the girls, and just wrap your arms around them, Lord, and, and keep them close to you, Lord. I know Mike knows where he's going. He's going to be with you face to face, Lord. But I just pray that in this time that a great outpouring of love would be put on their family. And that you would uh, that you would show him how close you are to him right now, Lord. And be with him, and help us uh, as a body to to come up around them, Lord. It, either prayer or or some physical activity, and where we come and help them at their house, Lord. So again, Lord, I just I lift this night up to you, and we thank you for your word. And I thank you for your love for us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.